Amen. You may be seated. And as you're taking your seat, I want to invite you also to grab your Bible. And um, with much excitement on my part, we are back in the Gospel of Mark. I cannot wait uh, to get back and moving. And you probably are wondering, are we going to be moving? We have not been moving. We've been slow. And I I acknowledge that. Um, I think from now on, we're going to be probably hitting our pace and hitting our stride because in the Gospel of Mark, what we've done so far has, has required a little bit of groundwork, and we've done a lot of background, especially on those Old Testament quotes, so that we could appreciate what Mark is teaching us about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, particularly why the person Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now we find ourselves, having wrapped up Mark's introduction, we move into the body of the story. And so I'm excited about this, and, and I want to, before we read our, the text, I kind of want to introduce this by just r- recapping a little bit of our introduction. If you have not been here, um, maybe going back to March, we've been in this um, study of the book of Mark, and you know, Mark is, is a profound gospel. It's quite easily my, my favorite gospel. I'm just blown away by Mark's presentation of of Christ, and it's just ministered to me uh, in, in some very unique and profound ways. Uh, this gospel is interesting that it, it starts with a, a title, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And verse 1 becomes a title, and then he proves that what he's doing in this gospel is a true fulfillment of the Old Testament by a quote that goes from verse 2 all the way through verse 3, and he's quoting Exodus 23 and Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3, and he combines three quotations, and traces this thread of redemptive history through the Old Testament and says, yep, like I said, this is the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, because good news, God has come. And so here's good news. God has arrived on earth, and that's what the Old Testament said would happen, and Mark's point is it's Jesus. He is the Son of God. Verse 4 to Verse 15 then kind of starts spelling out the, the, the introduction of this theme before he really gets going with his story. And, and like Mark does in every section of his gospel, he, he likes to bookend things. He starts with a, a theme and ends with that same theme. And that's kind of how we know how to read Mark, as we pay attention to his bookends. And he does that in every single section of his gospel, all four of them. And he does that in his introduction. Right here in the introduction, He begins by talking about John the Baptist preaching repentance. And he ends his introduction by highlighting that Jesus is preaching the gospel, and his message is the time is fulfilled, verse 15. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So his introduction is bookended by John preaching repentance and Jesus preaching repentance. This continues throughout the book, and I wouldn't expect you to remember this from back in whenever it was, April or March, whenever we started this book, but every section has a bookend. Chapters 8 through 10 is the second main section of this book, and it begins with the healing of a man born blind, but he's he's healed partially, and then he's healed fully. And then it ends with the story of a man born blind, namely Bartimaeus, who's healed entirely. And we'll talk about why that's so significant for him to bookend that section with those two miracles. Mark 8 to 11 to 13 does the same thing. Mark begins with the story about the temple and ends with the story about the temple, namely Jesus entering the temple and Jesus cursing the temple in the Olivet Discourse. Mark 14 to 16, same thing. He begins with the story of a woman and ends with the story of women. In chapter 14, he begins with a woman anointing Jesus' body for burial before he even dies and rises. And in 16, he ends with women who are fearful seeing an empty tomb, thinking about the implications of what this means now to follow Jesus Christ. We are about to launch into the body of this gospel, and the first section goes from chapter 1, verse 16, all the way through 8, verse 21. And if you understand the introduction, and you understand what Mark is doing, good news, God has come. He's come to earth. It's Divine touchdown in human form. Here he is. I would like to expect a first story along the lines of something like cosmic significance, global revival, universal repentance, and every man and every creature rising up to pay homage to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
I'd like to see some fan, fan, fanfare, some fireworks. I'd like to see something. It's a little bit underwhelming. Let's pick it up in, John, in Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Mark writes, As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, and the, uh, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. That's it. That's the story. Jesus calls these four disciples. And what's happening here is, is actually, it's very simple. It's about as simple as a story as you could possibly get in the Gospel of Mark. There's not even a single comment of background information. He just simply just lays out the story in a very simple sequence of action events and lets us follow along. But I want you to appreciate something because Jesus is, is doing something here pretty profound. John preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. Specifically, in verse 14, it, he emphasizes that Jesus began preaching repentance after John had already been thrown in prison. We're about to find out in Mark chapter 6, John the Baptist got thrown in prison and had his head cut off because he was preaching repentance. In fact, in the very story where Mark records John losing his head because he was a preacher of the gospel and he preached repentance, in that same story, it's, it's, it's a sandwich. It's, it's, it's embedded between this bigger story of Jesus training his disciples about what it means to preach repentance. And he gives them authority and an authoritative message and he sends them out to go preach repentance. And they go out and they're pretty enamored with it. They're like, this is amazing. We got authority over demons. This is really cool. Meanwhile, John the Baptist languishing in prison gets his head cut off, they come back and tell Jesus, hey, it was pretty cool, we had a fun ministry. They're not, even, they're not getting it. They're still not getting it in Mark 6. Jesus preached repentance, and they killed him for it. John's already been uh, arrested at this point. Jesus knows where this is going. He, know, he knows exactly why he came. He's already picking replacements. He's already training the next generation of men to bring the gospel of repentance to a lost and dying world. It's literally only the second action that Mark records Jesus doing. It's first he's preaching and then he's training men. Training men is part of his message because he knows what happens when you're faithful with that message. There's a timestamp on every generation of faithful preachers. And so it's not enough just to be faithful with the message. It requires the training of men to bring the message after this generation is either dead of natural causes or killed because of the hostility of a world. And so Jesus is training men, and this is really what it means to, what it looks like to enter Jesus' seminary. Let's pick it up in verse 16. He's going along by the Sea of Galilee. This is Lake Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and for you who've been there uh, you might have been over underwhelmed by the size and thought, this is a sea. This barely qualifies as a lake. It's actually 700, uh, 700 feet below sea level, but it's still fresh water because it obviously it flows into the Dead Sea, which is even more, uh, farther below sea level. Uh, there's all sorts of fish, uh, fishing industry. It was alive and well in Jesus' day. It's alive and well today. And it's here in around the Sea of Galilee where Jesus spends most of his ministry in the first half, in the first half of this gospel. Um, really, that's, that's the location of virtually uh, the massive majority of what happens in chapters 1 through 8. It happens right here at the Lake of Galilee. Now, you, you read this. He's, he's walking along by the Sea of Galilee. And, and as we hear this from Mark's perspective, it's, it's actually our introduction to these two disciples. Um, and... Um, and by the way, for, for you who are dutiful note-takers, 
Uh, this, this narrative is really so simple and so straightforward. There's literally no structure to speak of. And so I gave an outline for you that's going to be really, really, really helpful. Uh, point number one, notice, notice point number one is all the verses. Uh, Jesus trained men for the spread of the gospel. And point two, wait, wait, ready for this? We should too. Okay, so there's your outline. All right, let's, let's just focus here on the text here for a bit. He sees Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, and so look at what Jesus is doing. He, he just walks up to them. They're casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. Okay, that's obvious. They're fishermen, so that's what you do. And there, there's, there's several nets that would have been used. There's um, uh, literally at least four major nets in the fishing industry. Um, you, there's the, uh, the, the um, trammel net. There's the veranda net. There's the sign or the drag net. And this would have been the cast net. Cast net would have functioned uh, virtually identical to what you see today. So if you, you see fishermen catching bait fish before they go out for game fish, you, you have to watch them catching mullet or sardines or whatever. And the little fish you can catch in a cast net. And so you know, the larger the net, the, 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 the more skill involved. And so these cast nets would have weights around the perimeter. Uh, the ones that they would have used in Jesus' day would have been six to eight meters in diameter, which is that's a skill in and of itself. Um, and so they would take these nets, and you'd have to, get, you have to generate enough centrifugal force to get the whole thing to spread out, to get the maximum circumference, and the weights speed up the drop of the net on the outside so that it catches all the bait fish, and so they might see it over here, and they go over here, but then they're trapped on, on both sides. Then on the outside perimeter, there's a draw, a, a draw pole that you can start pulling up, and it will suck the bottom of the net together, and those weights uh, contract so that all the fish are now caught in the net, and then you can pull it in, and you've got bait fish. So that's what they're doing. They're actually cast netting, and they're in the process. They're, they're in the middle of their workday. They're, they're cast netting, and Jesus walks up to them in verse 17, and he says, follow me. I'll make you become fishers of men. He just calls them into to follow him, he calls them to become uh, his disciples. And you might imagine reading this, you think, oh, wow, this must, it's like, there's no, there's no, hi, my name's Jesus, I live in Nazareth, there's no, like, what, where's the introduction? I mean, like, this is amazing, just some random stranger says, hey, come follow me, like, sure, yeah, I'm going to hang up a, well, <laughs> a respectable, well-paying job, stop providing for the family, and just follow some guy I've never even met before, uh, which would not be quite the full picture. Let me just give you a little bit more from the Gospels here, just keep your finger in Mark for a second. Look over at John chapter 1, John chapter 1, I'm going to give you a couple cross-references, uh, one from John and one from Luke. First of all, in John, we read um, here at the calling, uh, we read a little bit about his, his, what happens here with John and uh, John the Baptist and these disciples. In John chapter 1, let's start in verse 35. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and, he, and as he walked, he, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And then the story goes on from there. But you can see in this story, you can see that um, at least Andrew, if not plausibly, Andrew and his brother Peter were both followers of John the Baptist. They were prepared for Jesus' ministry by John the Baptist, and they, right in this story, actually had personal encounters with Jesus even before an official call to ministry. So this isn't their, this is not like, hi, my name's Jesus, hi, my name's Peter type of conversation. Uh, there's a little bit of history, a little bit of water under the bridge already. Now let me show you one more cross-reference, and this is helpful as well. Look at Luke chapter 5, just to get a full picture here of what's happening in this call. Luke chapter 5 um, Luke tells us a story. He begins in verse 1. It happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. That's the Sea of Galilee. 
and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And so then he goes on to talk about how they have already failed, and Jesus goes out there and they catch all these incredible, incredible catch, miraculous catch, and they're overwhelmed because now they realize they're dealing with somebody who has control over nature. So Simon even says in verse 8, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. Verse 10, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So they actually had a business alliance. They were actually in business together. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And so you can see that there's been some ministry, there's been some relationship. Uh, They understand who Jesus is to some degree. They've been prepared for this by John the Baptist. They've been prepared for this by Christ himself and his own personal ministry to them already. And so now Jesus comes along with the Sea of Galilee, and this is an official call where they officially are being called to leave their employment. This is not, hey, take a vacation day. And this is not even just change your career. This is Hey, I know this is your dad's business. I know it's your dad's industry. I know you guys are doing well. Not only do they have multiple boats, according to Luke 5 and according to this passage, according to verse 20, which we're about to get to, they even have hired hands. So the business is thriving well enough that they're actually employing other locals in this industry. They're doing quite well. And it would have been their means of employment for the foreseeable future. This is how they would have provided for their family. This is a source of stability. And Jesus says, follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men, and they left everything. This has professional implications, this has financial implications, this has family implications. Thanks, but no thanks, Dad. I'm going to go chase somebody around, and we're going to do some ministry. In verse 18, immediately they left their nets and followed him. All right, we're still in point one. Jesus trained men for the gospel. Let's pick it up in verse 19. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. And so they're mending the nets. These nets had been torn. You have to mend them um, when, when they're dry. And in some situations, uh, you know, when it's particularly uh, the height of fishing season, they would try to do some temporary mending in the boat in the middle of the fishing day. But in a, in a normal course of fishing, you just... If you got a mend net, you just throw it to the side, you get another one, and then you mend that thing when you get back on shore. So that's what these guys are doing. They're, they're, they're part of the same business. They're partners in the same business, as Luke 5 pointed out to us. Uh, but they're getting nets ready to go for another, another uh, catch. And um, so they're just a little ways down the, down the same shore, uh, down that same beach. And so they're, in, they're mending those nets. He calls them, and it says, They left their father Zebedee in the boat, verse 20, with the hired servants and went away to follow him. The cost was great. How much did it cost to enter this seminary? Well, it didn't cost anything financially, but it cost him everything financially. It didn't cost much, it cost him everything. This is a calling that is lifelong, it's eternal, it's it's all-encompassing. You know, modern day seminaries will compete for uh, the cost of tuition hours. <laughs> what are the cost of tuition hours? Well, I think Jesus' seminary wins in that category, uh, but it also wins in the category of sheer cost. These men are saying, I'm going to give up everything. This is an allegiance that's going toward Christ that would even cost, in some cases, allegiance toward family relationships. And Jesus said, I came to, cast a, to bring a sword to the earth, not, not peace. And he came to uh, separate husbands and wives in times, fathers and uh, mothers at times from their own children, brothers and sisters. It costs family allegiance. In other words, a family allegiance cannot compete with a, an exclusive allegiance to Christ doesn't mean that you come to Christ and you lose every relationship. 
Some remain intact, some don't. The point is that none can compete with allegiance to Christ. What's happening here actually makes a lot of sense of another parable in uh, another story in Luke 9. And turn here for, for a second. We're about to, to make a transition here, but Luke 9 is interesting. Remember when um, Jesus talks about, he, he rebukes somebody who wants to follow him but wants to first bury their father? Lest you think what happens here is that somebody's father had died and he's just waiting for the funeral service the next day. What's happening here is cashing in on the family business to have a little bit of nest egg and have a little bit of earthly comfort and something to fall back on. In Luke chapter 9, verse 57, Luke records that they were going along the road. Somebody said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. And then Jesus' response might shock you if you don't understand what that means, because he simply says, allow the dead to bury their own dead. Obviously, he's not talking about physical dead burying the dead, because they can't. They're dead. He's talking about spiritually dead. Let the spiritually dead bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. The point here is that this second individual who's professing to be willing to follow Jesus Christ is not willing to count the cost that these four disciples in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, actually have already counted. Namely, to say, I'm not waiting around for my father to die to pass the business to me. That's what it means to wait and bury my father. It's not because he died yesterday and I'm burying him tomorrow. Otherwise, you just said, okay, yeah, take care of, take care of that, and let's go. we got to get going. This is the nest egg. This is personal riches. This is a temporal, something to fall back on temporally, to trust in and rely on. You enter Christ's seminary, there's nothing to fall back on, financially or temporally. And so they're following Jesus Christ. In fact, this is, what's, and this is where I want to start to transition here to what we're thinking about as a church today, because obviously this is a narrative. This is a narrative about what Jesus did. Historically, this is how Jesus trained men. And you've got to understand that Jesus' training of men, while it might have a few areas of uniqueness because of who Jesus Christ exclusively and uniquely um, is, how he trained men, and what he was after, and the responsibility necessary for those men has not changed. It has not even changed in the transition to the church age. What these men sign up for is the calling of every man training for ministry even today in the church. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And you're familiar with this passage. This is where Paul tells Timothy to be committed to training up other men for the sake of the ministry. And he says in verse 4, or sorry, verse 3, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. The, the, the picture here is somebody who's been enlisted in, the, in an army, and the enlisting officer is now the one who, who gives them the commands and the demands on their life. And for them to please their enlisted officer, they can't even get distracted with the daily affairs of life, the kind of things that ought to be taken care of uh, by other Christians with, in, a faithful, in a faithful day, in a faithful week, and in a faithful year. Think about a soldier. He's been called. He's been enlisted. He has a mission. You think that soldier is, instead of planning and instead of executing and instead of training, you think he's sitting around wondering about the next meal and wondering if he should add a little more cilantro to his taco? Or is he just waiting for the mess hall to just give him whatever they're going to give him? Daily affairs of life. Oh, can I, I can't even afford to be distracted by that. I, I'm on a mission here. And so these men, they're signing up. And that's really the story. That's really, we've already finished the narrative. But if you thought that that was the, the whole thrust of the narrative, you've got to think again, because the question becomes for us, even if we paid attention to this, and even if we know the diameter of cast nets of the first century, what is this narrative doing in the Gospel of Mark? What work is it accomplishing? It's the bookend. 
Let me show you the other half of the bookend. And this is where we'll be in a few years. <laughs> Chapter 8, verse 14. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, he said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? I mean, he's talking to his disciples here. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? I mean, he's quoting Isaiah 6 at them. Do you not remember? When I uh, broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? They said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? He's been teaching them about his identity. He's been teaching them about his mission. He's been teaching them by preaching. He's been instructing them by example. He's been teaching them by miracle. And he's asking them, Haven't you, aren't you connecting the dots? Do you get it? Do you believe? Do you have hard hearts? What's he doing here? You realize that Mark 1 to 8 is really, really emphatic about the training of these men. He starts with the, the picking of four. He's going to add another one in chapter 2. He's going to summarize the whole 12 in chapter 3. He's got stories throughout chapters 3 to 8 about the training of these men. And he gets to the end in chapter 8 and says, Do you not believe? Now, there's one more, one more detail we need to pay attention to in Mark here before we cut loose. There's a refrain in Mark 1 to 8, and in this case, this last bookend is actually one of the refrains. The refrain is a refrain of unbelief. Mark, as we're going to see, is going to systematically document unbelief of three groups of people. Okay, you ready for this? This is kind of an outline for the next year of preaching. The unbelief of the leadership, the unbelief of the people, and the unbelief of the disciples. Let me show you that refrain real quick, just so you can see why this is so important. Chapter 3, verse 6. Oh, sorry, let's pick it up in verse 5. Here's the refrain, comes in verse 6. Verse 5, Mark writes this. After looking around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to them, and he's speaking to the, 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 the Pharisees and the Herodians, he says to them, to the, to, the young, to the man there, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out immediately, and they began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. I mean, he is gripped with righteous um, anger and grief over the hardness of heart of the religious leaders of the nation. Their unbelief and their hardness of heart is on display, accentuated really from chapter 2, verse 1, all the way through 3, 6. Chapter 3, verse 7, all the way through chapter 6, verse 6, he's going to document and put on display the, the unbelief of the people, the nation themselves. Uh, and it ends in chapter 6, verse 6, with this refrain. And he, being Jesus, wondered, marveled, was astounded, was amazed at their unbelief. And then you get to chapter 8, verses 17 to 21, where he's sitting there saying, are you hard of understanding? Is your heart hardened? Do you not yet see? Do you not understand? Do you not yet believe? Unbelief of the leadership, unbelief of the people, unbelief of the disciples. But wait, there's more. To understand chapter 1, verse 16 to 20, you need to understand, the message of the unbelief of the leadership is not the point of Mark's gospel. And the unbelief of the people in chapters 3 to 6 is not the point of Mark's gospel. He's documenting their unbelief as, as, as an instruction for the disciples themselves. He calls them at the beginning, this is the front end, and the disciples are accentuated throughout, even in other people's section. Let me show you that. Chapter 2, verse 14, he calls Matthew 
He says to Matthew, uh, here's Levi, of course, Matthew who wrote Matthew's gospel. Levi, the tax gatherer, he sees him sitting in a tax booth, and he says, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Skip over to chapter 3, verse uh, seven, verses 7 and 8. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea and from Jerusalem, Idumea. And verse 9, he told his disciples they should, they should, be ready, they should stand ready because of the crowd. And so he's, trying to, he's, he's ministering to the crowd. He's trying to minister to his disciples. Finally, verse 13, he went up on the mountain. He summoned those whom he himself wanted. They came to him. He appointed the twelve so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. Twofold purpose of Christ's seminary is that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. And then verse 15, also to have authority to cast out the demons. Skip over to chapter 4, verse 13. He said to the disciples, in the midst of speaking parables to the people, documenting the unbelief of the people. This is the, this is the unbelief of the people's section. And here is a comment to the disciples. To the disciples, he says, do you not yet understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? Skip over to chapter 4, verse 35. On that day when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, he took, along with the, he took them along in the boat, and just as he was, the other boats were with him. There arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat. You know what happens. It starts to fill up. They think they're going down. He's sleeping through it, and so the disciples wake him up. Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing here? We're about to go down in this storm. He gets up, yawns, rebukes the wind. Yawn, I added yawns. That's for your entertainment. Don't put that in the text there. He, he rebukes the wind. He says, hush, be still. The wind dies down. It becomes perfectly calm. And they said to, he said to them, why are you afraid? Wouldn't the logical question be like, who wouldn't? In their right mind, who wouldn't be afraid? That is, that's the right question, though. Why are you afraid? They know enough. They should have known. How is it that you have no faith? And so they became very much afraid and said to one another, who is this then? Even the wind and the sea obey him. They're still not quite getting it. They're still not quite getting it. Jesus is still teaching them. He's teaching them what it means to follow Jesus, to follow himself in the face of the opposition and hostility of the leadership of the nation. He's teaching them what it means to follow Jesus in the face of hostility from the people you're trying to minister to. And he's going to teach them what it means to follow Jesus when you see unbelief in your own heart. And they finally start putting some threads together about his identity, but they're still not there in chapter 8. In chapters 8 through 10, he's going to teach them what it means to have to amputate ambition, selfish ambition, personal prominence. This is a long seminary. It starts right here in our text and goes all the way through chapter 10, and then all the way through the crucifixion, and then all the way after, and then all the way to Pentecost, and all the way, all the way till their death. the end of these men, minus the Apostle John, is going to resemble John the Baptist's and Jesus's. You know, we're going to quickly move to point two. And you understand this. I love, I love this text in this church because this church understands it's one thing to be faithful with the message. That's absolutely essential, and we can't be faithful without that. And it's also another thing to be faithful to train up men because we can't be faithful without that. This is our mandate, and Jesus is our model. And I thought it might be helpful. This is such a simple and straightforward text. It might be helpful to actually contrast what we see Jesus doing. Because when we see Jesus train, and this is a familiar story, I mean, if you've grown up in the church, you've heard these stories, you, you understand this. Jesus called them, they followed. End of story. Take it home. And sometimes we don't quite appreciate how radical the training of Jesus in his own seminary really is compared to what we have done in the church. When you fast forward to the church age, this becomes part of the Great Commission. And we already read that section in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. But if you went back two verses earlier, it says, Entrust these things to faithful and able men who are able to also entrust it to others. 
And so you have Paul learning it from Jesus, him training it to Timothy, and then Timothy who's able to entrust it to the others who are faithful, and then those others who are able to entrust it to others as well. So in, if you added Jesus on the front end, you get five generations right there in one verse of training the men. And there's a few examples in church history that are exemplary. I want to share one that I've never shared before because this comes from a personal letter. I'm going to nerd out on you for a second. I, uh, I'm a real nerd. I, I, I've actually, my, my wife approved this purchase. I found this crazy old letter on eBay. I don't know if this person knew what they had. It was an original letter written by a scribe, handwritten by my favorite historian, Jean Merle Henry Dubigny. He was a French historian and a French um, pastor in Geneva in the 1800s. And so I saw this letter, just somebody was getting rid of it on eBay. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's, that's, a, that's why eBay exists, is for this letter to be sold to me. <laughs> so I bought this thing, and um, I got it, and, and I was actually away when it came, and April opened it, and I said, hey, well, you got that letter? She said, the letter came. I'm like, oh, man, what's it about? And she's like, it's about finances. I'm like, oh. I was so bummed. I literally set it in my shell in my drawer, and I never really got to it until about a month later. I pulled it out, I started working through it, and it was just like this really ornate script because it was clearly a professional secretary who was documenting this. He had his own handwritten uh, uh, signatures at the end of the letter, but different different handwriting. So I started once I got started getting familiar with the script, I was able to start reading it. It's about an eight-page letter. He wrote it on March eighth, eighteen forty-four. And what was initially a disappointment about a letter about finances became the overwhelming thrill of reading about a man who was just simply asking for some financial help because he understood the critical nature of training men for the gospel. Among other responsibilities, Dubigny was also the uh, leader or the secretary of the society, Evangelical Society of Geneva, and they existed for the evangelism of France and Switzerland. I'm going to read to you a couple paragraphs of this letter. He, he says this. He's writing to um, some potential donors in the nation of England, which is the only reason the letter is written in English. The branch of our society which undertakes the direction of the coal porters, and coal porters are people who would be, uh, they were basically responsible for distributing Bibles. And so in this letter, you're going to hear the word coal porter, and he's, he's, he's emphasizing that it's not enough to evangelize a nation like France by just giving them Bibles. You need more than Bibles. You need trained men. That's his point here. So that's just to understand that term there. And uh, it undertakes the direction. It's, it's on its work with activity uh, uh, and continues to disseminate the Word of God with tangible blessing from on high. And thousands and tens of thousands of Bibles have already been circulated and read and continue to penetrate into the regions and villages of France. But it is not enough to sow the good seed according to the appointment of the Lord himself. This must be accompanied by the preaching of the word. To many, too many are the enemies which we have to combat, and so various are their modes of attack that we are required to be continually on the watch. Nor may we neglect any of the means which the Lord has commanded us uh, or permitted us to employ for the propagation of his gospel. The fowls of the air devour a part of what is sown. The devil uses every effort to turn some from the faith and by various means to disturb the minds of others. He tries with his accustomed subtlety to blend truth with error and so to intermingle them that it is often extremely difficult to separate them. Thus, the, the latter is often received by persons who are really seeking after the former, but who from being but partially enlightened are induced without it, to, without knowing it, to embrace what is false. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue on in just a second, but what he's describing there is true of France. They were so inundated with the Roman Catholic gospel, he's pointing out, you couldn't possibly give them a Bible and think that's going to be enough to evangelize them. They need preaching. They need men who are equipped to expose the nature of those errors so that they can actually read the Word of God with meaning and with understanding because it's already been perverted and already been subverted. The larger the measure of truth in a religious system, the smaller the quantity of error, the greater is the chance of its succeeding with honest-minded persons who feel the want of religion. It is only because... Um, Roman Catholicism professes to retain some of the great truths of the gospel that it has seduced so many piously disposed persons. And it is because some new doctrines contain a large proportion of 
scriptural truths mixed in with some errors, that they are employed with so much success in our days by the enemy of souls to stop the progress of the gospel in France. Those who spread these baneful principles are, for the most part, well-versed in holy scripture, but alas, it is not to edify that they wield the sword of the Spirit, but to destroy. Cole porters are not often, uh, often not sufficiently well-instructed to refute these insidious reasonings. We are asked for clergymen, for teachers in Israel who may be able to combat with their own weapons, but employed in a legitimate manner, conformable to the will of God, who, who's, are those who rest the Scriptures as Peter expresses it. We receive daily from many quarters pressing solicitations for evangelists. The, dominion, the, the, the diminution of donations to our society has suggested uh, the propriety of reducing the number of our laborers and amongst others, of withdrawing from the department of, and then he names a French, a French uh, region. And then he goes on in this letter, I'm going to stop there, because he goes on in this letter to give several, several examples of pr- pastor after pastor after pastor and preacher after preacher after preacher being trained up in that church in Geneva under Duvigny's pastoral leadership, who are ready to go into France, but lack the funds to get there. It was a sweet letter, and it just stirred my heart to see that it wasn't about finances. It was about men and the gospel. You know what we've done in the church for 2,000 years? As the church has weakened, we have sold the farm when it comes to training men. I want to give you a real brief if I gave you a 10-minute documentary of the history of training men in the church, um, you'd probably, you know, if you were flipping through on your TV to try to find uh, your, your favorite team, you probably wouldn't stop for a nanosecond at a 10-minute at a documentary on the history of training men in the church. But in, endure this illustration with me to appreciate how radically different this is from what we just read in the Gospel of Mark. As I, as I just highlight for you how the church has traditionally trained men, ask yourself the question, is that going to accomplish the lessons that Jesus taught his disciples? Is that going to train men to crucify their own selfish ambition and their own pride? Are they going to be able to win the battle in the desire for popularity? Are they going to be faithful when the people they're ministering to express hostility in return? When the leadership of our nation or governing authority starts to crack down on a gospel that's offensive and that's exclusive and that exposes the ridiculousness of this culture? Can those lessons be learned? Can they be won? Can they be forged into the conviction of the next generation of preachers in the traditional model? Or is it only the church? And as I walk through this, Ask yourself, who do you want shepherding your grandchildren? This is the story of how the church has done it. We started in the early days, faithful. The second generation of the church just did what the apostles had told them they should do because the apostles were the authority, and and the church was on the run. And from Diocletian all the way down to Constantine, there was outbursts of, of pockets of persecution that kept the church largely faithful. Once Constantine made Christianity legal, then everything foul and everything false is able to creep into the church. In the year 300, one historian who wrote a book on the the history of theological training said that people training for the ministry would have trained by by the 3rd or 4th century for two years on average, by by 580 days, by 600 days. 40 days. So 600 years into the church, you've got an expedited fast track of training for ministry that sounds kind of like what happens at Brigham Young if you're going out on a Mormon mission. It's like a six-week crash course. You've been trained. The old word in the patristic era was the cats accumulate. They have been trained. They finished their course. What happens in those days in the patristic era, it's not, it's not monasteries so much that's on the rise. It's not universities that hasn't even begun yet. What happens in those days is mentorship. It's training of one individual, and they would charge a high fee. And so it would have to have a patron or somebody would be a major donor to pay for you to be go trained by an individual. And usually what set par- apart individuals who trained were their rhetorical ability. 
And so the greatest orator, the greatest public speaker would have the greatest number of pupils and they would make the most amount of money. In the years 300 to 600, you start seeing a transition and a rise of the monastery. The monastery became predominant, and by 600 to, 6 to 1200, the, the monastery is starting to dwindle, but it's still strong, and, and, um, and what's happening is you're moving into the scholastic era where scholars are starting to train men. In this era of medieval scholasticism, you got four major uh, names, Aquinas, Abelard, Hugh of St. Victor and Lombard, and you say, okay, why does that matter? Well, just hear me out on this. This is fascinating. I don't know, if, none of you have probably heard of the word, uh, the, the, the book called The Sentences. The Sentences was like Theology 101. It was the, the most well-known theological book in the med- medieval ages. It was written by Abelard, I mean, by Peter Lombard, and the second most influential book in the uh, medieval era was a book by, by Peter Abelard. So Peter Lombard wrote the sentences, Abelard wrote this book, and uh, his book was just called, it was literally, Sic est non, um, it, yes and no, or it's this and it's that, it's not that. And uh, what he did is he just took 158 theological questions and then lined up commentaries throughout the church and said, here's people who agree with this statement, here's people who disagree, discuss. And that became how you did theology. So you have people who are being trained by Peter Abelard, and this book is just so ridiculously bad. It's just such a massive display of learning and intellect. It has nothing to do with fidelity to the truth. It just simply says, here's some positions, discuss amongst yourselves. That's all it is. And so that became scholastic training. In, in, the, in the scholastic era, um, one example of how bad this got is, well, let me, let me explain this. A master's degree is somebody who's mastered the sentences. So they've mastered the sentences, so now they can teach the bachelors. A doctor is somebody who can actually teach in the church. So you wouldn't even really need to be handling the scriptures until you get a doctorate. In fact, Andreas Karlstadt, who actually taught in Wittenberg with Luther, said that on earning his doctorate, he said that at that time I had not yet read the holy scriptures. You, were, you actually weren't even supposed to touch the scriptures in some contexts until you had gotten that kind of degree. To the point that William Tyndale could say that of that era of training in the universities, no one can have a look at Scripture until they've been so shaped in heathen learning eight or nine years before you can actually get your hands on a Scripture so that when you actually do, you can't even get at that meaning of Scripture. The meaning that you're supposed to see is now formed in your mind, and so it's there when you read it, and they prevent you from even hearing the Scriptures. At this point, you've got to transition to the universities. In the 11th and uh, 12th centuries, the universities are on the rise on the continent and on England, and now universities start taking over the lion's share of training of men. And that's really the way it is today, although secular universities would be you know, largely laughed at as a training place for, inst- for, uh, for men in the ministry. It's now it's seminary. So if there is another transition in the modern era, it would be from secular university to a Christian seminary, an institution of higher learning, yet still outside the church. And that's really where we're at today. It's a mess. John Frame writes in his book, The Academic Captivity of the Church, which Interestingly to note, one of his few books not published by PNR, because he said this book would not be published by any of the major publishers because it's way too controversial. He just flat out says we need to bring back training to the local church. And so it's, it's uh, published by a little tiny publisher, an unheard of publisher in, in Florida. And he writes in that book, he says, the independent seminary, if it is faithful in teaching the word of God to the students, is doing the work of the church. It must be absolutely self-conscious of this. I argue for a model of theological education that is explicitly church-based. In the final analysis, it is the church and only the church that is competent to make the final assessment of the teaching of its ministers and seminaries. You see what he's saying there? He's saying, look, if the church is called to preach the gospel and to train men, who has the authority to say when a man is trained? Who has the authority to say when the gospel's been preached? An institution? Let alone a secular institution? Even if they're believers, a board of trustees? Isn't that the responsibility of the church? I came across a fascinating book a few years ago. There was a, there was a trend in publishing where 
Uh, several publishing houses were putting out books on the pastor as a theologian. There's about three or four major ones that came out. One of them was written by two scholars who neither one have ever been pastors. So they're now writing a book for the church on why pastors need to be theologians. They acknowledge the irony in their preface, and they say this, Speaking of credibility, what gives us, two professors, two professor theologians, the right to issue statements about the nature and role of the pastor? We are acutely conscious of our lack of qualification. Period. End of the book. <laughs> why, why did you keep writing? <laughs> to be a theologian in the academy is to risk becoming a disembodied mind. To return to the graveyard, the theologian who's not a pastor is like a soul that after death has been separated from its body, and we regret this unnatural intermediate state, but as believers in resurrection, I mean, it's just, you just go on and on. You're still waiting for it. And they just simply say, here's the bottom line. We don't wish to exaggerate. There is a place for academic theology, but it is second place. First place, pride of theological place, belongs to the pastor theologian. Again, period, the end. Finis. Why are we still writing? It's therefore only fitting that we dedicate this work and they go ahead and dedicate it to pastors. Oh, great, you dedicated it to a pastor, but you already have admitted you have no authority to be saying the things that you're saying. Entrust this to the only institution purchased by Christ's blood. Entrust this to the church. And the fact that the church has failed and punted on the training of men to patrons and orators and then to monasteries and then to scholastics, and then to universities, and now to external seminaries, does not mean that the church should continue to punt. There's only a few examples that I know of that are just really extremely heartwarming. You've got faithful examples, and we've talked about some, like what happened at Geneva and Lausanne and Switzerland. One of my favorite examples is what happened at Lutterworth. You know the name John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe trained men in the academy and in the church. And those were two radically different experiences. John Wycliffe was one of the greatest minds in Europe in the uh, 14th century. He died in 1392. He taught at the University of, of Oxford. He was a representative of parliament in the foreign level to Belgium at times. He was a known uh, proponent of political theory and even economics. And when he wrote, the entire nation listened. All of parliament read his stuff. But he was primarily a theologian. He tried to train theologians. And he trained up theologians. He trained up some of the greatest minds who became part of the Lollard movement. And then he left the academy, he left parliament, he left politics, and he committed himself to a local church in Lutterworth, a tiny town. I've been there. It's a 5,000 person town. He committed himself to Lutterworth and he preached and trained men. The reason, I'm convinced, the reason why we know John Wycliffe's name today is for two reasons because of training men at Lutterworth and because of the English Bible. He trained men at Oxford, and some of those were compromisers. Some of them were just theological prima donnas. Many of them went back to Roman Catholicism when they realized they couldn't make enough money in Protestantism. He trained men in Lutterworth. He brought the training back to the church. He said goodbye to the academy. He said goodbye to parliament. He said goodbye to all uh, that was known at the time of how people pursued theological ex uh, uh, education. Go back to Mark chapter 1. You go back to Jesus training these disciples. You go back to the trials they endured. You go back to the temptations they had to face. You go back to how long and hard Jesus had to hold their hand through that entire training process. That cannot happen in the monastery. That cannot happen in the university. That cannot happen in private oratorical mentorships. That requires the church. That's how Jesus Christ did it in his earthly ministry, and that's how he's doing it now since he began the church on that very first day in Acts chapter 2. So what I did to conclude, I just want to give you a list, a list of ways that um, the church is so unique from any other training. The church is unique in this area of expertise. In those other examples that I gave you in that brief history of the training of men, expertise is a niche 
niche area of academic expertise that distinguishes a man from other scholars. It's the promotion of an argument that's never been made before. It makes that man an expert, which is why people study under him. In the church, expertise is godly character, humility, ability to articulate truth, and skill in shepherding. When it comes to measuring expertise, those are radically different in all of those models that I described for 2,000 years versus the church. Number two, the nature of oversight. It's radically different to give oversight over a student for a period of academic study for eight semesters versus giving oversight for a soul for this year and the next and premarital and after marriage and children and after children and, and all the way through widowhood into eternity. Totally different scope. Human standard of evaluation is radically different. In traditional models right now, whether that's university or external seminary, it's accrediting agencies and agencies that have a standard that approve of what schools do by way of theological education, what constitutes success, as opposed to the church. I mean, can you imagine... A generation, could you imagine, like, just, just be, use your imagination for a second. Imagine a country like the United States, let's just say, where the massive majority of pastors are trained outside the church with degrees that were accredited by institutions that would also approve evolution and homosexuality. I mean, could you even imagine something like that? Isn't that crazy? That's where we've been living? It takes no imagination at all. I mean, the picture of Jesus' model should just shock us. It should be so, so fresh. Another area where it's different is the notion of usefulness. For these men that Jesus were training, being useful to the master is sanctification. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. In the other forms... Usefulness has to do with scholarship and writing ability, mental acumen, the speed and ability to digest and categorize information, rhetorical ability, quick wits, ability with verbal debate. And finally, last area here that's worth mentioning is the dangers of compartmentalization. There's a danger here that comes from trying to fulfill the responsibility of the church outside the church Usually the reason why I hear that um, people say, no, you can't train men in the church, you, you won't be able to pull it off. Usually it's because, oh, there's disciplines that are so technical and so, such a high level that you just can't even do that in the church. You need the uni university, you need the institution, and, and, and the church takes care of the spiritual qualifications and the institution takes care of the academic ones. Well, that's just ridiculous, uh, because I've seen it done, <laughs> and that's just not the truth. But what's the lie there? What's the lie is that model starts to produce the idea that church takes care of character and the institution takes care of church history and Hebrew and Greek and the implication then becomes church history, Hebrew, and Greek don't have anything to do with spiritual formation. I've been in enough institutions and I've got enough degrees and I've taught and I've had enough experience to say absolutely, hands down, institutions that are doing those technical studies cannot touch what the church is doing. The ability of men in a church who are learning from men who are shepherding souls, giving oversight for souls, there's a level of precision and burden and intensity that far surpasses the speculative ones in the theory of what might happen in the institution. So i got to ask, what does this have to do with you? Because I know you're asking that. You're like, man, that's interesting, maybe. But how does that affect me? Tomorrow morning, you might be folding socks, you might be taking kids to a practice, you might be at work, you might be uh, repairing a vehicle, and you might be asking yourself, okay, so Jesus was passionate about training men, and Jesus did that, and the church is supposed to do that, and he's excited about the spread of the gospel, and I should be too. Where does the rubber meet the road? What does it have to do with me? It has everything to do with you. I hope that the contrast between what the church has done 
uh, unfortunately, over the last 2,000 years, and what the church must be doing and what we're doing here with TES at Grace Bible Church, I hope that it just puts some wind in your sails. If you ask the question, what does this have to do with me? I have nothing. I have no desire to be involved in the institution. Amen. That's why it has everything to do with you, because you're involved in a church. Do you understand? You're involved in a church. You, do you realize how far short the model of church is that just shows up on a Sunday morning and hears a good sermon and maybe sends a few texts here and, here and there and... We're talking about life on life that is formative for guys like the next Peters and Andrews and John and James. So we're talking about church planting, the next Omri's and the next Josh Kelso's. We're talking about being part of that. How does that work? Well, I want to end with a story. When I was uh, pastoring, I'd been pastoring about seven years in Florida, and ministry was going well. I was, going, I was actually been pastoring six years, but it was my sixth and seventh year, 2011, 2012. Um, I was shepherding a college group, among some other responsibilities, but that was the main bulk of my, my ministry. And There was about 90 students coming to this ministry. Um, I was pouring into those students. I was preaching to them. I was exhorting them. I was just wanting to see Christ formed in them. And in the course of um, one calendar year, about a third of the ministry left the church. 30 plus. I remember, I remember one day literally listing out the names in the last calendar year of people who left the church. Uh, not because they finished school and moved away, <laughs> but because they were just sick and tired of whatever. And in some cases, even resorting to slander and public accusation that I'm not even qualified for ministry. Disciples would come to me in the church and say, hey, I'm pouring into so-and-so. We've been meeting uh, weekly for like a year now or two years or three years, and I don't even see them around. I mean, do you see them around? Where are they? Can I, they're not returning my call. What's going on? People were leaving, and this was a notable test for me. I, I, God had just been gracious, and there had been fruit in my ministry, and I was seeing progress, and it seemed like lives were being changed, and in some cases they were. Can you imagine what the Lord did in one calendar year of watching people that I had sacrificed for and poured into who then turned around to accuse my character on their way out the door? You realize what the Lord was teaching me. The Lord was teaching me lessons that I could never have learned in a classroom. I could have read about. I could have heard people lecture on. It took a church. What do you mean it took a church? Do you know, could you possibly imagine the kind of wind that was put in my sails by people in the church who are being the church? Not just the pastors, the church, the people who are calling me up and saying, hey, where's so-and-so? They left, and I'm just devastated thinking it had something to do with me. Oh, John, thank you for being so faithful. Thank you for being so clear enough to run them out, because they weren't responding to their sin. Wow. Wow. There's a mature saint who <laughs> got their head screwed on straight and just ministered to me as a young pastor. You realize the, how it puts wind in the sails as a layperson for you guys who are working on vehicles and selling insurance and building a building and, and washing socks and doing everything else, and you are being the church. And you think about your maturity, the depth of your convictions, and how you live for the glory of God in your context, and how that rubs off on as we are training men. Not, not TES, we as a church body are training men. GBC, if, if you understand Jesus' model, you understand how important it is that you're passionate about training men. This is a church endeavor. And so my prayer is that you would embrace it. This is going to require everything. The church is better, and the training of men is better with the godliness in the marriages and the godliness in the homes in this congregation. Think about the effect you wives have when you are faithful in your homes. Think about the lessons learned for young men who are training and their wives who are learning from you and the impact that that has on next decade or two decades or three decades of ministry. The trials and lessons that we're going to learn from Mark 1 to Mark 10, training to men is often behind the scenes, 
But the way Mark frames it up, it's going to be central to all of those lessons. And so we're going to keep learning these lessons, but what's so sweet about it is as we think about, there's also an application that I won't be repeating every time about what we do here. GBC, embrace this. I want you to walk in front of the men who are training for ministry. Look, they might have the gifts that they need, but you have the character and depth of conviction that they need. You think that makes a difference on a young man training for ministry? When, as we heard yesterday, to hear a widow boast in her Lord that he is perfect, to bring her through two decades of caring for her husband? No one ever learned that in a monastery. Ever. This is the ministry of the church. So Jesus gives us that example. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the, your model and thankful that we can even apply this very directly here with TES. Uh, we have men training. We have seven men in the seminary right now and two starting who will be in orientation this Saturday. And Lord, they, um, they need all of us. That's not something that a couple individuals take care of. That's something that requires a church. I thank you, Lord, for the saints that you've brought here. Their godliness, their diligence, their faithfulness is not optional. It's integral to, to, what, um, to what's happening. Lord, we think about what James and John and what um, Peter and Andrew were in Mark 1, and we contrast that with what they were in the book of Acts. And we can see, Lord Jesus, we see your fingerprints all over them. And what you can do in a short amount of time is, is amazing, but it certainly is going to require the gifts of the church. And so, Lord, I just pray that as we think about this example, and as we think about what Christ did, and as we see his patience with these young men, we see um, how gracious he is towards them as he continues to teach them and instruct them and as they start to develop convictions and as they start to grow in their character and their humility and their depth of conviction, I pray that you'd give us a Christ-likeness um, as a church for those nine. And um, Lord, we just ask that you do that in such a way that we might even, we'd love to even see the fruit, Lord. And if we don't, that's okay. But we would love to see the fruit of what you alone can produce as you train men through the only institution that you bought with your own blood. In your name we pray. Amen.